Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and today we have a very special guest, Peter. Uh, and I'm going to like just patiently say his last name. Peter Showstead H is here today um, to have a talk on neo nihilism, the philosophy of power. And Peter, uh, he he's better known today, or he speaks more on on psychedelics and and uh, panpsychism. Um, but I kind of reached out to him, wanting him to talk about neo nihilism, this philosophy of power, because that's how he first came on my radar years ago. Um, I think it was Warren Ellis, the comic book author, gave him a nice plug, and I read it, and I was like, huh, this is a really interesting take. Um, and I always wanted to talk to him. I never got a chance to do it on the former podcast, and so I thought this was a perfect opportunity to do so here at the Stoa. So, how today is going to work? I'm going to actually the MC today is Ariel Friedman, um, and I'll hand it over to her. She'll explain what the Q and A process is, um, introduce Peter, and then um, she'll have a discussion with him. Then pivot to the Q and A. So Ariel uh, runs a podcast called The Multiversity Project, where former anarchists and uh, discuss culture war and meaning crisis and stuff like that. And she also does something called the Dangerous Space here at Stoa, where we safely talk about dangerous ideas. And so after the the recorded uh, part that hour whoever wants to stay afterwards we'll have like a 30 minute dangerous space session uh, and Ariel has a little bit spotty wi-fi connection so I might have to jump in but uh, we'll give it a shot um, so I'll take uh, Ariel in right now you, you can unmute yourself cool thanks Peter uh, yeah so today we're going to be talking about neo-nihilism with Peter Shostead H uh, neo-nihilism it's philosophy he developed based on Hume, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche's philosophy. And the way today is gonna go is we're just gonna have a, a brief interview portion while I'll ask Peter some questions to kind of open up, open up the space around his ideas. And if you guys have questions, like as they come up, you just put them in the chat. And then we're gonna have a period where we'll ask Peter some of your questions. So this is gonna end up on YouTube. So if you don't want uh, your face and person appearing on YouTube, you can just, uh, you know, we'll ask if you, We'll ask you if you got if you want to read your own question. If you don't, then then I can just read your question for you, or Peter can. So is is that is that clear? If you don't want to appear on YouTube, we can read your question. And if you do, then you can read your own question. You get the chance to do that. After that, Peter's going to announce some upcoming events, and then post the event. We'll have a little discussion around around some of these some of the topics that came up today. Uh, so let's get right into it, um, Peter. Uh, mm. So. One thing we're kind of wondering about is like before we really get into like the nitty gritty of your philosophy, I was feeling kind of curious, like how you how you got to neo nihilism, like what was your journey to, to getting there. Right. Well, um, I guess um, Nietzsche is mostly responsible for that. So I, um, you know, started studying Nietzsche when I was 18 in my bachelor's degree and it's sort of um, along with some of the other great philosophies sort of blows your mind completely and just makes you question all your axioms and um, so that was the beginning of it. But I was also reading Hume, of course. Uh, I did philosophy bachelor's, I should say. And, um, and then in London, I was working in a college where I was teaching uh, Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, his, one of his last books for six years. And uh, on top of that, I was teaching um, epistemologies. Um, and then a nice kind of... Um, a nice kind of um, connection occurred where a lot of the sort of the 20th century epistemologies on ethics that I was teaching sort of um, cohered with Nietzsche's view, views on good, good and evil. And, um, and I decided to just write a quick essay in a very um, kind of, um, you know, forceful manner. So it's a kind of style of writing, which I don't normally do. It's not, I don't normally speak like that, but I thought I'd try a bit of hyperbole but keep it as concise as possible, just to express the fundamental aspects of Nietzsche, Hume, as you say, and actually from Schopenhauer, because a lot of Nietzsche's works are based on Schopenhauer's. So I, um, yeah, so I just wrote this quick uh, essay. It was 10, what, 11,000 words or so, I put it online, and, um, and then it became a chapter in my book, Numenautics, uh, a year later or so. Um, 
and I didn't think much of it. It was just really to put, I didn't think it would be, you know, red <laughs> or anything, but, but um, then out of the blue, yeah, um, Warren Ellis, uh, suddenly one day actually I had a peak in sales. And I thought, why the heck, why, what's happening here? And I discovered that this uh, quite a well-known comic books uh, writer, Warren Ellis, um, he sort of based this um, recreation of Karnak, this, this um, comic character, superhero, partly on neo-nihilism. And then it became uh, yeah, more and more pop popular after that. But then I personally sort of moved on from that, as um, Peter Lindbergh was saying, I sort of uh, then got into um, more of Schopenhauer's panpsychism um, and then ultimately Whitehead. And, and then I took some magic mushrooms, which kind of changed my interests quite considerably. Um, and I got into psychedelic philosophy. Um, but that's, yeah, that's basically the way it is. Cool. Cool, thank you. Uh, so, so what is neo-nihilism? What is neo-nihilism? Well, okay, so uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's ultimately the doctrine that, um, and this is really nothing new. This was, I mean, you find this in Plato with characters like Thrasymachus and Callicles, but it's ultimately the, the, the argument that there are, n there are no such things as objective morals, objective values. Um, but it's not a sort of traditional nihilism which says that there are no values, there is no meaning to life and there is no truth. That's why I added the prefix neo. It's um, compatible with the multiplicity of values in the world and one's own self-valuation. But ultimate, the ultimate point of it is, before you get into all, all the details, that any moral proposition or any normative moral proposition, in other words, when you tell someone or people what they ought to do, when you issue a command or an imperative, um, ultimately that cannot be based, uh, that cannot be a truth statement. It can't be true. Um, it's ultimately a means of trying to that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, cool. Uh, do you want to elaborate on the power bit a bit, like how neo nihilism connects to, to power? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, this is the Nietzschean bit, really. So um, there are, in the 20th century, there were a number of philosophers who said that, um, you know, um, that moral propositions like I ought not to lie, I ought not to steal, one ought not to steal. Um, these are either meaningless or they are false or non-cognitive or whatever. There's different versions of that. Um, but they were never based on those were mostly based on a kind of um, an empiricism or a logical positivism, which can never like metaphysically uh, substantiate those claims. So what I've done in neo-nihilism is I've linked um, this kind of epistemological view that ethical propositions don't have truth value, ultimately to um, a metaphysics of power based on Nietzsche's will to power, will as a macht, which was, um, which for those who don't know is, um, a view that um, at the fundamental level of all things, and there are different interpretations of this in Nietzsche, but ultimately, um, as you find it, especially in, in, from 1886 onwards, from beyond good and evil onwards, um, there's this notion that at the fundamental level of reality, um, below matter even, um, there is everything strives for power. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean greed, it doesn't mean conscious greed or power as we understand it. It's more akin to sort of growth, but it's not growth as, as we understand it either. It's, um, it's, Nietzsche calls it a pathos, a feeling. There's a feeling, um, a desire to develop, basically. This is how I see the world's power. This is something Nietzsche sort of um, spoke about more and more as, it, as he um, got older, and he was actually going to name a book, The World of Power, then he changed it, um, and then his sister and other editors um, created this book of late notes, and they called it The Will to Power. So this was not the book that he was really planning. Well, this was not the book he was planning to write because it's just notebooks. But nonetheless, he was planning to write a book on The Will to Power. Um, but of course, in 1889, he, went, he suffered a mental breakdown. He went you know, insane in the colloquial and uh, never completed that. But I think he was on... He was on a mission to create this sort of metaphysics of, of power, which could substantiate uh, 
moral truth claims and, and uh, you know, met, and politics and, and so on and so forth. So I suppose, yeah, the po ultimately when you say, I mean, coming back to neo-nihilism then, when you say something like, um, you know, one ought not to lie or something like that, ultimately what this is based on is power. It's ultimately a person or a group trying to tell other people um, how they should behave. They're not stating a fact. They're not saying, you know, if I said like this table is made of wood, that could be, that could be verified and, or falsified and um, it would be a statement of fact. But if I said one ought not to lie, the proposition is very similar to that statement, but of course it's not verifiable. Um, and it's very hard ultimately to substantiate that. And of course there are very many normative ethics, utilitarianism, deontology, so on and so forth. But ultimately when you get to the fundamental question of, you know, why do you believe this if you don't believe in God? importantly, um, then it comes to nothing. So this is in a way a continuation or a kind of expression of Nietzsche's claim that God is dead, because what he meant by that is not simply the fact that we, you know, we don't believe in him anymore, the Christ, Judeo-Christian God, but rather the important part of that expression is that if you don't believe in this um, biblical God, then you have, if you don't believe in the Christian God, he says this explicitly, you have no right to Christian morals. And even Nietzsche's point, really his criticism of Western culture is that even if you don't believe in Christianity explicitly, most people still assume Christian morals because they've had 2000 years to sort of embed themselves within the Western mind. Um, but ultimately this is based on God as both lawgiver and as um, a kind of a, a creator that gives humanity a purpose and gives each human a purpose. If you take away that creator, and that lawgiver, um, you're sort of left in this abyss, you know, the sort of 20th century existentialists um, consider this sort of negative in a way, or liberating, depending on who you read. But ultimately, um, Nietzsche's point is, if you don't believe in the Christian God, you've got no right to Christian morals. And for him, Christian morals included utilitarianism and socialism and so on. Um, and in fact, any ism, any ideology, capitalism or Marxism, whatever have you, um, you've got no right to that. So where does that leave you? Well, if you think that values are only those Christian values, that legacy of Christian values that we have inherited, then of course it's very negative. And then you get into this kind of, um, into this um, melancholy abyss where you think everything's pointless. But this is of course only based on a belief that these are the only values. And this is why Nietzsche also speaks about, you know, this distinction between master and slave morality, that, um, you know, Christianity is the epitome of slave morality. And this has been so influential that um, <clears throat> we've um, assumed that to be morality itself. But of course, Nietzsche speaks about, you know, former moralities, other moralities around the world. Um, so it's not as if destroying these Western values means there are no values. It rather emancipates a person to say, um, number one, one can create uh, the values one pleases. And secondly, it's kind of emancipatory because it, it, one doesn't take any kind of moral impositions as truthful, you know. If someone says you should do this, or one ought to do that, or society should be like this, or we must get rid of this, or this is evil, and so on. You know, it sort of uh, it makes you, well, it immediately makes you say, why? You know, what, what's the basis of that? Upon which standard, you know, of morality? And if it is based on a normative morality, which is rare, but, but then you ask, well, can you ultimately find this objective moral upon which it is based? Um, yeah, so, um, so that's more Nietzsche. But anyway, so it's implementing that. It's also, also I should say, you know, you read Nietzsche, Nietzsche is very critical of Schopenhauer in the later works, but then when you read Schopenhauer, you realize how much Schopenhauer actually influenced Nietzsche. And um, anyway, like, so Schopenhauer, I bring in the analysis and bringing Schopenhauer as well, because he said, you know, he was an ethicist, but he wasn't a normative ethicist. And this is a very important distinction in, that I'm making in um, neo-nihilism. And Schopenhauer said that um, the, the morals that we have inherited are um, imperative morals, you know, Kant, criticizes Kant, those sort of post-Kantian, he criticizes Kant for, for just simply assuming that morals must be in the imperative form, thou shalt, you know, um, as opposed to the descriptive form, which I'll explain in a minute. 
And this, I mean, Schopenhauer even uses the term slave morals, which people just attribute to Nietzsche, but um, it's in Schopenhauer already. But Nietzsche's criticism of Schopenhauer is that he still assumes a kind of Christian legacy because he, because he thinks that, well, these, these Christian values are the greatest values and they're not true. So one should just simply um, fall into pessimism. But let me just um, explain this difference, this fundamental difference then between prescriptive and descriptive ethics. So, and this is the first part of the essay really, neo-nihilism. Um, there's two ways of speaking about ethics generally, or one can speak about them in two general ways. Um, so descriptively, like an anthropologist would go to another society or look in the past and say, these people believe this, you know, the ancient Spartans believed this, the ancient Athenians believed this, and uh, they thought this was good and this was evil and contrary wise, another society thought complete opposite. And, um, you know, in this society, this small section of the society, we believe this, that's just describing people's moral beliefs and behaviors. And that's fine. That's an anthropological, sociological. But as opposed to that descriptive morality, most people, when they talk, when you say, talk about ethics and morality, they consider it to be prescriptive. So that's when you prescribe actions, when you say things um, are like this, but they ought to be like this. And what this, these people did was wrong and what these people did was right and so on. And, and that is what I take issue with neo-nihilism, that form of ethics. That, um, because ultimately, yeah, this is really fundamentally, ultimately it assumes a kind of Platonism that there's a transcendent form of the good, ultimately, in most cases. Um, I remember when I was PhD student at Exeter, every two weeks or so we had um, an ethics paper in a little group of PhD students and professors. And ultimately all these, all these ethical papers came down to this fun fundamental point, you know, but how do you ultimately substantiate that axiom, that ethical axiom? And um, that's what neo-nihilism tries to break down. Of course, it doesn't prescribe any actions either. No, it doesn't say, you know, this is not evil, therefore you should do this or whatever, because that would also be prescriptive. It just leaves you, it's just sort of, um, it's like a, a deletion mechanism. It just sort of try, uh, seeks to at least, um, obliterate this kind of belief that is so prevalent still. So there you go, that's sort of my, <laughs> it's probably a bit messy in the wrong order, but those are the fundamental points. No, that's, that's great, that's great. You covered pretty much all the ground you want to get to in the interview portion, so that was a right. great intro. Yeah, why don't we move on to, to some people's questions, because I see the chat's blown up a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Rain, do you want to ask uh, one of your questions? Okay, so just, sorry, just to review, what we're going to do is I'm going to pick someone. You guys can either ask your question yourself, or if you don't want to do that, just shake your head or stay silent, and then I can ask your question for you if you don't want to appear on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to ask, some of you guys have multiple questions in there, so I'm going to ask by calling you, just pick one. So, Rain, go for it. Sure, thanks. Um, hi, Peter. Hi. Um, so I was wondering how, how neo-nihilism accounts for uh, different studies that have shown moral stages of development. Um, you know, Kohlberg's comes to mind, but there are other models that show a similar progression from pre-conventional to conventional to post-conventional. And, you know, it's scientifically validated and it seems to be true across different uh, cultures. Um, yeah, how does neo-nihilism account for that developmental aspect of morality? Was it Kohlberg who committed suicide by jumping off a cliff? I think it was, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, now I've read Kohlberg many years ago um, and this theory of development. I mean, I would say this, how, again, and this will always be my answer to probably everything, like how, when you talk about moral progression, how do you know what the standard is to which one is progressing. How is that determined? Um, so with Kohlberg, it seems to, he just assumes, I can't remember the details of him now, but it's, um, one is just that you don't want to be told off at the primal level, right? And then later on, it's, um, one has some kind of conscience whereby one doesn't care what, what other people think, something like this, right? But ultimately the point is this, um, this kind of theory assumes a morality, it assumes a standard, like this is the greatest form of uh, morals there are. 
and then applies that standard to different societies and says, look, this society is here, we're in the middle somewhere, you know, ideally we'd be at the top. But my question would be, how do you, how do you substantiate that standard in the first place? How did Kohlberg know what was moral in order for him to talk about progression? I mean, this is, this is the fundamental uh, question. Well, I, I can answer that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so the progressive aspect is not based on um, a projected ontology of an ultimate morality, but it's an observation that um, people go from pre-moral to moral. But if you observe and study descriptively, they never go backwards from moral to pre-moral or from, or sorry, from conventional to pre-conventional. So there is a observable linearity. That's what makes it developmental. Okay, but that still, I would say that, that notion of um, development is based on a preconceived standard. Um, and also, is it true that we don't go back? I mean, if you think about, you know, like in England here, I mean, you think about the Romans and civilized Romans, you know, they invaded uh, 50 BC and then they stayed until about 400 AD. Um, after that, you know, the Saxons came, they were brutal, you know, we really returned to a sort of what was generally considered a sort of primitive form of morality. And it took, um, you know, a thousand years again to sort of reattain that Roman uh, level of um, etiquette and civil civility. If you call the Romans civilized, of course, I mean, like, you know, they were, they were also, you know, extreme colonizers and imperialists, of course, you know. So, but my ultimate point is that, um, okay, yeah, you, you can see developments and generally, um, morals change but to say they progress i mean i'm in a descriptive sense yeah you can see different societies and you can see how they change and that's descriptive morality as i was saying and that's absolutely that's a legitimate science you know social sociology or anthrop anthropology or whatever but or history but um to say that one society is somehow superior to another society is a proposition that can't be in any way um, validated. So like one, you know, for example, if the, I don't know, if, if, like, if you take um, the Viking society who, um, who valued like a hard heart and they disvalued compassion in many cases, um, if they were to see the society of Sweden today, um, my homeland, uh, they would think, oh my God, what's happened to these people? You know, they've become, they've really retrogressed, you know, they've really become sops and so on. Now, of course, today we'd say, yeah, but you, these were brutal barbarians who didn't know what was right or wrong. But, but I would say no, we can't judge it that way. We can just say they had a different form of morality. You can't, you simply can't talk about progress or retrogress. Um, well, no, like, actually, like, like, you, you can because... Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe yeah. let's maybe let's move on to another to another question. This is we want to. There's a bunch of in the chat, but this is a really interesting exchange. So I appreciated we had some back and forth there. Um, Rachel, uh, do you want to ask your question about trolls? Yes. Hi, Sue. So, yeah. Thanks ah, for Rachel. finding good. Good to finally put a, a face <laughs> yeah. to the name and the thinking. I wanted to ask <laughs> you as. Uh, yeah, a, a Nietzschean, a fellow Nietzschean, right? Um, the philosophy of power and the nihilistic trolls who are beyond good and evil in a really degenerate, annoying way. You know, like the, the people who, the, the, the 4chan crowd, you know, they're, they're hyper nihilistic. How, okay. how do you suggest that, um, ha, ha, have you dealt with these people? First I, I haven't actually, no. It's uh, first to hear about them. Okay. Um, I, just co commenters, commenters on YouTube videos with low IQs. Have you dealt with people like that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, th so I, th I, yeah, I ignore, I mean, I ignore people like this okay. immediately, you know. That's why I don't know so about them. I, I, I wish I was you. Um, <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but my question um, about all of this is when these people who refer to themselves as nihilists begin you know, talking about Nietzsche and, you know, just being, being nihilist in this degrading way. How do you suggest, um, I guess, ignoring them would be the answer for us. Um, but did you have um, another solution, maybe like a, a through the ages kind of conclusion? Um, just how, how do you feel about all of this as a whole? Uh, 
um, I Nietzsche said something like the the answer to a low brow is a clenched fist. Of course, you can't apply that on the line, can you? So that's out of the question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just, um, you, yeah, tr trolls on the internet. I mean, I just, uh, uh, just ignore them now. I've, I realize that number one, there's just no point debating anything with them because they'll never concede. And so it's just frustrating and you, you, you just can't win. So I just, just completely ignore them and, and try to not let it uh, affect me in any emotional manner. But I must admit, I haven't received that. I have, when I was younger, I did, yeah. But um, another thing about a lot of followers of Nietzsche, and I admit this, and I hope I'm not one myself, but they're really annoying. <laughs> you, get this, you know, this kind of um, Nietzsche fanboy club. Um, and Nietzsche does appeal to like men in their 20s quite often, I notice. That's, you know, I, and I'm guilty of that, it appealed to me then. Um, and that's sort of why I moved on to Schopenhauer and then Whitehead and Bergson and people like that afterwards. Um, and I don't think Nietzsche was right about everything at all. I mean, he also, he, you know, personally, he was in many ways a failure, but um, if you, but not in a moral sense. <laughs> but um, yeah, how do you deal with them? I mean, I, I think you've suffered from them then, obviously, haven't you recently? Um, I don't, yeah, it, I, don't, it's, I don't know, I just... Um, I just wish they weren't like degrading Nietzsche's name because Nietzsche was so yeah. pivotal to me growing up. Yeah, And no, it, it, it's just insulting to, to his work. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, he would, he would be ashamed. And actually he, um, he was, I remember Nietzsche wrote about the anti-Semites, you know, he said, he called them, you know, barking dogs, because his, he said, he found out his name was linked, some anti-Semites were talking about uh, him as, as one of their own, and he was aghast by this. And of course, he was very ashamed of his sister, Elizabeth, for marrying a sort of leading, an, you know, anti-Semite Aryan, who created this colony in South America, you know, with blonde children, and the legacy still remains, strangely. Um, but he was very ashamed of this. And I think, likewise, he'd be ashamed of most of his followers today, perhaps even me, I don't know. But, um, but um, yeah, you know, uh, you have to have a, you know, you have, to, I think anyone can read Beyond Good and Evil and say they're a Nietzschean, right? And it's, you know, they, they need to prove their, I think they need to prove themselves to be able to question, you know, talk about him really, either critically or in a sort of, or advo in an advocatory manner, if that's a word. But um, yeah, no, uh, mm, yeah, no, I can't really answer that question properly, sorry, but um, ignore is the best answer, you know? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Okay. okay, cool. Um, I am seeing uh, a lot of questions from the same few people. So I'd encourage you if you hadn't submitted a question yet, and there's one on your mind. Uh, yeah, uh, please do stick it in the chat. Um, yeah, Peter, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, so do you think it could be dangerous if neo-nihilism gains traction and followers due to a misunderstanding it with, uh, uh, I, sh I should say, less sophisticated colloquial understanding of power that it currently exists, like might makes right type thing? Or do you think neo-nihilism is inherently an elitist philosophy only for the elites? Um, well, I think it can get out of hand. And I remember actually, and one, one of the reasons I moved on from it a little bit is because um, I don't know if this is true, but someone told me once that I think it was in Mexico, there'd been a number of little group who had read this and in a criminal manner, used in a criminal manner, uh, some kind of gang. Um, so there is that danger. Um, and this is why the text is only available in print, actually. There is a, a danger for abuse. Um, with regard to it being an elite thing, no, I don't think so. I think um, it, this is, I mean, this is really for everyone. And in a way, if people really read and read this, studied this, there'd be less conflict because you'd realize, you know, there is no answer as to whether tea is better than coffee, whether abortion is right or wrong, you know? There is no fundamental fact of the matter. And in a way, this would um, maybe ease tensions um, if you consider that to be desirable, which is, of course, not, not an objective fact. I'm reading Spinoza a lot at the moment, and he really um, said the same thing. You know, there's, the more one knows the facts of the matter, the less conflict there will occur. Often conflicts occur because uh, one person or one group thinks certain, something's absolutely right, or way behavior is absolutely right. Another group will think this is now absolutely wrong. 
and they'll just debate it. But, you know, fundamentally, neither of them are, are right. So I think um, it's not an elitist thing. However, of course, um, it is in one's interest sometimes. If one was founding, a, if I, for example, were founding a state, I wouldn't advocate the reading of this because it's obviously in the interest of a statesman, statesperson, to um, make people believe that morals are objective and it's much more easy to control people that way, of course. So the question as to um, it's whether one should uh, proliferate this is really dependent on who is speaking, what position they're in. And so there's no absolute, there's no absolute answer to even that question. I got a follow up. Uh, and yep. um, so, so yeah, that you kind of answered what I was going to say is that um, in order to gain power, one must obfuscate their desire for power uh, at times, given the context or the domain. Um, but would you say that having an explicit um, awareness of power and, and stating that you have power kind of ameliorates the more pathological effects that lead to the unnecessary suffering? Um, I mean, this was Spinoza's view that the, you know, pers you know, peace of mind is achieved through further understanding, you know, I mean, if you, um, if you understand people's psychology, you're much less willing to judge them, you know, if you know their background and so on, you know, you know why they acting this way, you know why they believe this, you know, it sort of makes sense. And that stops one's own emotional uh, reaction to that. Um, and generally, I think, um, you know, the, the more knowledge one acquires, the more peaceful one becomes, really. Um, but that's not, again, an objective desire. That's if you want to become peaceful, you know, if you want to achieve peace of mind, other people may want to be more adventurous and get thrills and so on and so forth, you know. So, again, it really is it's very much a matter of perspective. Um, so that you just cannot give general answers to these questions because there are no general truths uh, ultimately with regard to it, in my view. But of course, I understand this is a very contentious, unusual view, very controversial view. So most people won't agree with it. Um, obviously, people's sense of right and wrong is part of their self-identity. So if you start questioning that, they'll become, you know, like uh, very defensive and think, well, this is, then I've misunderstood, you know, my whole life and my ro the role in my life and so on, you know, so I understand that. It's the same in philosophy of mind. When you start questioning what the mind is, this is my main field, really, philosophy of mind, you know, when you start questioning people's, you know, sense of self or ego or, or uh, desire, whatever it is, you know, they suddenly become very, very defensive and aggressive because you're, you're questioning a person's own identity, as I say. Um, this is as well, but that's what sort of makes it more exciting, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, it's not, there's nothing worse than just people just trudging along with the same old concepts, right? So, and even, you know, at the very least, it's, it, it's sort of, um, um, it's a matter for debate. But like I say, ultimately, um, I've, I've, although I wrote this quite a few years ago now, um, I've never come across any refutation of it, you know? Cool, thank Not you. Not to say there isn't one, I'm always open-minded to refutation, but I, I so far haven't, I haven't read one, so, yeah. So I think, you know, but uh, another side effect of this, of course, is that it kind of makes, it kind of pushes you away from society in a way that's not necessarily personally positive. So when you see these great debates about, you know, you know certain politicians or, or uh, movements or whatever, you, you've got this kind of cold distance from it all. You think, well, I'm looking at the, 20, the early beginning of the early 20th century here. This is what kind of people are starting to believe now. Uh, this is the same as it was 300 years ago, whatever. And this will move on, you know, um, and that's not really, I, I mean, that's sometimes it's good to get down in and um, start arguing, arguing for, but you can do that with neo-nihilism, you see, because ultimately neo-nihilism uh, says that there are, you know, there are no objective values, but there are subjective values. So I have my own preferences. I don't want a, a tyrannical world, you know, I don't want um, certain people to be in power because it's, I don't want like a third of England to be owned by the old aristocracy from thousand you know as developed a thousand years ago by William the Conqueror that's not in my personal interest so I might then you know issue decrees that try to mitigate these um, obstacles to my own power ultimately or my own development and um, that's absolutely there's nothing wrong with that you know and this is actually life this is what life does you know even bacteria 
uh, they seek their own advantage, you know, or their group's advantage, family advantage against others, you know. So this is just the way, this is a descriptive element of reality. Um, but if, uh, you know, but, you know, most creatures don't have normative ethics. They don't, you know, sharks don't say, you know, you should swim around us now and again when we get hungry. This is a good thing. You know? <laughs> they don't do that. Humans can do that. But it's um, ultimately, as I say in the book somewhere, um, morality itself is a power structure it's a way of us trying to get what we want you know mostly subconsciously unwittingly so um i don't you know when people put themselves on a moral pedestal and say this person's just disgrace or one this is the ideal society you know what they're really doing is they're trying to gain power themselves but they won't be conscious of that fact you know this is a way that nature works through human conceptuality um but ultimately it comes down to this i think Cool. Cool. Sam, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. And I'm actually noticing that uh, Rain's comment just hit that pretty directly. Um, I was just kind of noting to myself uh, when Peter and Rachel were having an exchange that there was clear distinction being made between, uh, I'd say, Nietzscheans that we'd be proud of and ones that we might be more embarrassed of. Um, so there's a, a vector of judgment happening there, clearly not of a moral basis. And uh, I was wondering, is this is this an aesthetic judgment that's uh, playing out here? Though Rain's, Rain's comment here um, just uh, touched on Peirce's argument that it has to do with uh, the capacity to uh, adhere to uh, those who can kind of engage with logical arguments either in a uh, good faith or accurate way or rather a fallacious way. So I think there's, there was definitely some of that going on, but I'm curious what your thoughts are beyond that. Uh, okay, so um, the judgment about Nietzscheans one might be embarrassed about. I mean, that was, yeah, that's uh, an, an aesthetic judgment. Um, I'm not telling them how to behave. Um, and if I were, if I said, you know, you guys should shut up, that would be an expression of my subjective valuation. I'm not, I would not be claiming that it's an objective fact that you guys have to shut up. <laughs> that would be a contradiction. But of course, it's not wrong to contradict oneself. You know, it's not an immoral thing to do under this doctrine. So I could contradict myself and willingly deceive people, which would not be wrong because there's no such thing as ultimate wrong. Um, it would just be um, a mode of my power uh, or attempted power expression. That answers the first little bit of your question. Um, did you have a second uh, question that you can formulate in a proposition? You, you address the aesthetic component uh, quite dead on there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and Nietzsche, of course, speaks a lot about, I don't know what, Nietzsche talks about aesthetics a lot, you know, and tragedy and, and the Dionysian worldview, I mean, um, but, you know, interestingly, I, um, you know, bring, I became interested in Whitehead after Nietzsche, Alfred North Whitehead, who died in 1947. And um, he, <clears throat> he thinks there's an as, you know, for Nietzsche, there's this fundamental level of will to power, which Whitehead, interestingly, is interested in. And he had the notebooks, will to power, got a copy of it annotated. Um, but for Whitehead, uh, the fundamental drive of the universe is more than simply power. It's also beauty. And um, this is an interesting component that I'm currently looking into. Um, but I won't talk about it now. I mean, that's another podcast about Whitehead. But um, I'm, I'm not sure if fundamentally the ultimate level of reality is, is power only. I think power is, you know, it's a very ambiguous term as well. And, you know, it's quite reductive in a way, you know, so... However, um, even if you question that fundamental metaphysic, you know, what lies under physicality, um, wh whether it be power or as an aesthetic drive or a, a drive to knowledge or something like this, um, still the fact remains that if you make a moral um, uh, judgment or proposition, like, um, like I said, one or not to murder, um, that has to be, you have to still give reasons to substantiate that. Normally, one thing I didn't mention is this difference between hypothetical and categorical imperatives. So a hypothetical imperative is, um, an, is a, a means and an end expressed with an if clause. So like, you know, if I, if you want, if you don't want to go to jail, 
you ought not to murder people, right? Now, that is um, an ought that is perfectly legitimate. It's got an if clause. If one does not want to jail, go to jail, one ought not to murder people. Okay, so I don't want to go to jail, and I therefore I don't I don't want I ought not to murder people. I also have no desire to murder people either. Um, but prescriptive morality, um, especially issuing from Kant, um, is usually devised in terms of categorical imperatives where there's no if clause. So it's simply one ought not to murder. And for Kant, if you add an if clause, it suddenly becomes very subjective. But the neo-nihilist uh, doctrine then is that um, all uh, moral propositions are hypothetical. They all have an if clause, um, even if it's implicit, you know. So, um, and that's usually, you know, one ought to follow the law if one wants to live in a harmonious society, okay? So then most people do want to live in a harmonious society where they can use Zoom and write books and so on and so forth and get on with their friends. Most people want that. But of course, it's not absolute. You know, some people don't want to live in a harmonious society. They want to uh, have adventure and war and so on, you know? We shouldn't forget there were gods of war in the ancient past. And we can't say that's immoral because then that, again, that would be based on, um, you know, an absolute standard. So, um, yeah, so um, this distinction, so you can get oughts from an if, but you can't get oughts from an is. And to derive an ought from an is is where Hume comes in. Of course, this is Hume's guillotine, the is ought cap, you know, just because something is a certain way doesn't mean it ought to be that way. And you see this a lot. You say, well, um, you know, we have evolved to be compassionate to one another. Therefore, we ought to be compassionate to one another. I mean, this is just a non sequitur. It does not, does not follow. It's, um, you could just eat same by the same principle say we have evolved aggression therefore we ought to be aggressive uh, but nonetheless despite this simple point um, it's often often uh, committed this fallacy next question <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, jbt do you want to ask yours gbt yes i i'd be glad to so, Peter, um, since you mentioned Bergson and Whitehead and, um, and of course, Nietzsche, I'm wondering, you've already explained somewhat how Whitehead and his notion of beauty and perhaps related to that creativity uh, might be related to Nietzsche, but I'm wondering about uh, Bergson's Ilan Vital also as a kind of um, notion of self-organizing emergence within subjectivity in time and how that connects to the will to power. I'm just wondering, you know, since you've moved on from Nietzsche, I'm just wondering how some of the um, yeah. individuals you've studied then have caused you to reflect back on your mm. neo-nihilism. Mm. I mean, that's a profound question, which I couldn't do justice to, but I'll, uh, I'll give, it a, give it a start. Um, so the Elan Vital, sort of vital impulse in Bergson is a creative impulse that lies within all life for Bergson. Um, there are similarities between Bergson and Nietzsche. I mean, you know, like um, in the last sentence, I think of uh, his last, Bergson's last book, where is it now? Um, he says, he talks about the overman, you know, the superman, you know, there's this, there's this belief, I mean, Nietzsche has got this notion of the Ubermensch, it doesn't really fit in that nicely to his philosophy, but um, it's, it's very ambiguous about it. Um, it's translated as Superman, Overman, whatever. Um, and Bergson's, Ilan, Bergson's created, he's got a book called Creative Evolution then, as you probably know, and um, he believes in a teleology in nature, so that evolution is working in a way that's not completely random, but there is actually a standard to which things are evolving. And as they meet, certain species meets a certain obstacle, they will evolve around that. And that's why you get the multiplicity of species. But then nonetheless, for Bergson, yeah, there's this ultimate um, goal towards which the Ilan Vital is going. Um, and ultimately he says, you know, famous in this lovely uh, sentence, the purpose of the universe is to create gods or something like this, right? Um, and so there, you know, there's interesting analogies with Nietzsche there. 
he also talks about Bergson also talks about the imminence and Whitehead as well. You know, this is actually I must say, I mean, it was Nietzsche who really got me into through you know, it, it was Nietzsche who got me into this um, into Bergson and Whitehead because you know the will to power really is um, an imminence, like a subjectivity, not consciousness, but a sort of drive and a, a pulse, you know, like a pathos, he says, within all things, he says, at least in his notebooks. Um, and this is very similar to the Elan Vital in a way. Uh, of course, for Bergson, Elan Vital is not just about power, but actually, in many ways, you can, you can read it that way, you know. The purpose of perception is to see more things around you um, that are that one can practically act upon, thus empowering a person, in other words, or a species. So like making them develop more and more. So there's a lot of interesting um, parallels. I'll also say that when I was at Warwick University, um, uh, my, my lecturer was Keith Ansel Pearson, who's like a specialist in both Bergson and Nietzsche. So, so uh, he's, I'm sure he's written a lot of interesting stuff about this, much more interesting than what I'm saying. But yeah, no, there's certainly the parallels. And of course, in Whitehead, there's, you know, he's known as a pan-experientialist. Now we're getting to pan-psychism, um, whereby there is this element of subjectivity, again, not consciousness, but there is a striving. In Spinoza, there's Canatus, a striving. In Leibniz, there's a dominant monad, which is a striving to develop, you know. It wasn't, and then, of course, in Schopenhauer, there's a will to live. So it's not like a new thing in Nietzsche. Um, I, so can I uh, just... just uh, uh, just do a quick follow-up. I know there's other folks yep. that need to get in, but um, I'm just wondering if, so basically you've said that in, in propositional terms, uh, you cannot validate morality. But if we take John Bervakey's notion of uh, four different types of knowledge uh, from the propositional to the procedural, perspectival and participatory, and not just the propositional, which you, is what you're basing yours on. Mm -hmm. If you look at the participatory, as we engage intersubjectively with other people, that we can say that there are things that we can do and not do, say and not say, that is beneficial both or not beneficial to oneself mm -hmm. as well as to the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think you you can you can draw some lines that would you know be clear. You can look at it both. You can look at it you know harm to them physically, mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally. I mean, so there's ways of of I think framing morality uh, other than just propositionally. Okay, I mean, I should know this. I, I haven't read um, for Vakey, but I'm speaking with him on the weekend, so I should learn this quickly. <laughs> but, um, um, <laughs> Yeah, no, interesting. I mean, okay, so the interesting thing about uh, Whitehead compared to Nietzsche here is that Whitehead talks about good and evil, but also in a kind of relative sense in which he says, you know, there are the epochs um, which strive towards a certain harmony, and evil is the fragmentation of that harmony. And um, so you get a lot of, you get process theology, theologians who try to uh, bring back Christianity into this. Whitehead now was a Christian, then he became a uh, uh, an atheist and then he became a theist again but never a christian again but i should say this yeah that for whitehead um evil and fragmentation of social of a social purpose and you can understand that because whitehead's view of reality was much more integrated so you know he talks about perception as prehension so when you see something that becomes part of you it's not just you as an individual opposed and this is uh, Nietzsche is more individualistic in this sense you know it's you know me against the world in a way although he says the self is a hierarchy of wills. Um, and so yeah, absolutely is the case that it's in one's interest to harmonize um, with others around one, harmonize with the world ultimately. Um, however, two things I'd say against that. Number one, a lot of people would say that's a hypothetical, you don't have to put it into propositional formats, but in a way, it's, it's selfish. It's not altruism ultimately, it's egoism, isn't it? Because you know, it's in my benefit that I get on with everyone, right? Now, some people would, um, you know, so, certain moralists would say, well, that's, that's not proper morality, that's selfishness, you know, disguised as morality. Another thing is, second aspect is, um, what is beneficial to one's group, one's family, nation, or whatever it may be, is sometimes um, antagonistic towards another group. Um, so like, um, 
I don't know, like, uh, you know, sharing water amongst a certain number in, in one's group. Um, of course, that would be antagonistic to another group who wanted that water. And now, of course, ultimately, if you shared it all, let's say, then there, would be more, there wouldn't be enough water for all. So you'd have to make this um, distinction that um, morality then is, is um, conducive to a group, a social harmony, um, but it can't be conducive to all, you know, because ultimately uh, there's competition for resources and there's also differences in desires. Like I said before, you know, sometimes we assume that peace and harmony is what everyone wants, but I wouldn't, you know, look at history and around the world, you know, that's not necessarily the case. And even if it were the case, how could you prove that to be an objective fact that one all ought to aim for peace and harmony? Now I say this, you know, purely uh, uh, rationally. Of course, I myself, I think I'm very sort of harmonious with my friends and family and the little village I live in here in Cornwall and so on, you know. Um, but I still maintain that ultimately you can't, um, you can't sanction this, you know, uh, ultimately. You know. Um, and that, you know, can actually be beneficial to stopping conflict, as I say, sometimes. But at the same time, why would you want to stop conflict? You know, this is again another moral, you know. Um, conflict, you know, we would not have evolved, and this is again Nietzsche, but we would not have evolved into the complex organisms that we are, were it not for many obstacles, obstacles and conflicts down the road. You know, he doesn't think suffering is bad, necessarily a bad thing. You know, or obstacles are a bad thing. This is uh, again a form, a Christian, a legacy of Christianity. Well, we need we need antagonists. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. I just want to say that one thing. <laughs> when I was on, I mentioned the concept of antagonistic cooperation, as Peter well knows. So ah. I just want to leave that there. Okay. I'll look that. into that. I, 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 yeah. okay. Good question. Thank you. Well, we're, we're, we're going to try to squeeze in one more question, I think, before the hour. Um, Dan, do you want to ask your question about sociopathy? Uh, sure, let me see if I can find it here. Um, it's been a very active... Okay, if, uh, if power is the driving ethos in neo-nihilism, is this philosophy inherently unethical, amoral, perhaps even sociopathic, lacking a system of meta-values such as interpersonal dignity, collective well-being, and personal integrity. Personal integrity, kind of integrity with self and also inte integrity with, with the ecosystem. Um, I'd say yes, it is an amoralism. Yes. Um, with regard to the other things, I don't know what you mean by meta values. Could you elaborate on that? Um, it was something that came up in a discussion. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly. Greg and Enriquez, who's a... Uh, a psychotherapist uh, that was in a, a dialogue or a dialogos with um, John Verveke as well as Jordan Hall. And this was, a, this was something he introduced, uh, the psychotherapist introduced as a system, I guess a system of, of, I guess if you're going to have what, what John Verveke calls this reciprocal opening or this unconditional love or this agape, then, then having a fundamental system of meta values helps for the cohesion, social cohesion and, right. okay. and uh, communitas and, and cooperation and collaboration and things of this nature. Okay, uh, well, I just, I mean, I would call those meta values just values. Uh, you know, it's just another class of it. Um, you know, does it, if you ask the question, does this lead to the pr sort of um, halting of cooperation and so on? Um, it can do, but, but it needn't. But if it does, who's to say that is wrong? I mean, this is like a meta, there's sort of the assumption that, you know, there are, we, you know, again, it's an assumption of morality saying that cooperation is a good thing integration is a good thing uh being you know um golden rule is a good thing i mean this is uh this is exactly what i'm questioning i'm saying how, how do you substantiate those claims you know it's complete control all delete i mean i i mean i i hear you on one perspective but you could have a situation for example I, I forget what like if you take the gini coefficient if you i forget if it's a one or a zero 
let's say you have a million people in a community and that one person in the community has absolutely all of the power and everyone else has no power, no wealth. Mm. Um, you could look at it from the stand, I mean, one measure, you could say, is that society going to exist or is it going to let it, you know, you, there are some measure, is it resilient? Is it going to survive in, you know, in the, oh. in the biosphere? Okay, I mean, this is a descriptive question though, isn't it? Still, it's like, well, this probably won't survive and that's just the way it is. Um, but if you were to say, therefore, that tyrant or whatever ought to distribute his wealth, or resources or whatever, um, you, know, you know, according to what, if what, um, if he wants to survive, okay, well, in that case, yeah, he will. And that's, you know, why most uh, tyrants never last, you know, as uh, Spinoza even said, but, um, and Plato even ultimately. But um, how about if, you know, um, someone just wants to achieve ultimate power for a very fragmentary time? I mean, although it's an unusual thing uh, to desire, it's not a desire can't be wrong. I mean, this is Hume's famous um, expression that it is not contrary to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. This is uh, just a matter of, you know, it's not, again, it's not contrary to reason. Of course, it is very unusual. But you can't say to that tyrant, well, you know, you should distribute your wealth. You, you could say you should distribute your wealth if you want to survive. And then if he does want to survive, which you presume he would, then he, he might. Um, and also from those beings that are under him, of course, they would want to denigrate, destroy his power. And you can un understand that, you know, um, on the space of will to power. Um, and you can just understand how these things play out. But ultimately, there's no um, objective transcendent standard by which you say, you know, all power should be distributed equally. This is, this is not um, a fact of the world. Good. I'm noticing we're out of time, but this was, this was a super cool discussion. Thank you so much, Peter, for coming and, and having this, this conversation with us. And thank you guys all for your really awesome questions. Uh, so what's going to happen now, I'm going to hand it back to Peter Lindberg. He's going to uh, announce some upcoming events and close off the space. And after that, we're going to hang out for a bit and do some like dangerous space type games and discussions where we process some of this, some of this event. So you can feel free to go after the announcements or you can stay for another half hour or so. And we're going to, we're going to do some post event conversations. So I'll hand it off to you, Peter. Thank you. Um, so I'll make some announcements in the morning, uh, in the moment, but uh, Peter. My friend, thank you so much for coming to the, the STOA today and, and uh, having your ideas uh, stress tested by all the meta weirdos here that uh, congregate at the, the STOA. That was um, really fun, really fun. Great and anything, anything you'd like to leave us off with or like maybe with some places we can find you or your work or what you're doing next? Um, well, I, yeah, I'm based at Exeter University. Um, well, in theory, when the global situation calms down. But otherwise, yeah, onlinephilosopher.eu. Um, I've got a Twitter handle, Peter Shuster H, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook on Logistics, where I just, you know, I'm constantly reading stuff. So I just, you know, sort of quote interesting lines. I read every, most days. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, Twitter's probably the best place. Cool. All right. Um, so upcoming events, uh, we got one later today, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the, the folks from Future Thinkers, uh, UV and Mike, are going to talk about the smart village they are creating, um, so that should be fun. And uh, um, on Thursday, we got a special guest, Ang Angus Callard. Uh, she's gonna come in to do a talk, a lecture, Can You Know You Are Wrong? And uh, Angus is, um, what is she again? She's like a professor, associate professor at the University of Chicago and author of a book, uh, Aspiration, The Agency of Becoming. So that should be super cool. We've got tons of events, like we have on next Monday, we got what we got Derek Jensen, we got Alexander Dugan, we got like John Zerzan the next day. So all these like, you know, um, if this place doesn't get canceled, then, you know, we're, we're doing something right here. And uh, Ariel Friedman will be uh, doing post dangerous spaces discussions after those ones as well. Uh, so if you like what we're doing, you can feel free to support us at Patreon and then more events on the website. Uh, so that being said, uh, we'll go on a quick bio break and then I'll take in uh, Ariel and we'll do the, the dangerous space not recorded. Again, thank you everyone.